Hi Rod. Good evening everyone. Thanks for coming again to another Friedman dinner. Uh, I normally give you a spiel now as to why we've called this a Friedman dinner, but enough of you have been here before that you've already heard me say that five times, so I'm going to skip that tonight and uh, instead replace that with telling you about the uh, wonderful conference we had uh, last weekend down in Sydney. Now, we've been, thank you. we've been coming to these Friedman dinners, some of you with me for uh, the last two, three years. Uh, what happened last weekend is thanks to Tim, who's not here at the moment, but Tim Andrews, he pestered me enough and convinced me that we should do basically 26 of these back to back over two days. And so last weekend we went down to Sydney and for the bargain price of $70 for students, $100 for adults, so next year remember, uh, you had two days full of the best libertarian minds in the country and uh, a dinner with a wonderful dinner speech by our guest international star Tom Palmer. So we've managed to convince Tom to uh, stick around long enough to come and give a few more speeches. Tim has been trekking with Tom around the country, Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, Canberra, everywhere, uh, except Adelaide. Everyone, every place else. <laughs> nice choice. Um, going around, uh, trying to, well, trying to, successfully, speaking with students, debating socialists, and giving wonderful talks at dinner events such as this. So we're very uh, thankful to have him up here tonight, Tom Palmer. If you haven't heard of him before, you really should have. He's uh, one of, I think you were described last night, I think it's be close to the truth, perhaps the, uh, the greatest living libertarian advocate in the world. So that, that's a big claim. Uh, but he'd be close to it if he's not. If he's not. Uh, he's got a PhD in Pulsi, I believe, or something similar from Oxford. Uh, he's more famous for being an executive vice president of the Cato Institute, no, of the Atlas. Atlas and a senior research fellow or something similar to that at Cato. Also the, the head of Cato University and uh, Tim was recounting the story yesterday at IPA if any of you were there. As a young man Tom had hobbies like we all have hobbies it's just that his hobby was smuggling free market textbooks into the Soviet Union and when that got a bit boring then smuggling in uh, photocopies? Photocopies and that, that's an interesting thing to try and smuggle I guess not in your back pocket. Uh, but anyway, without any more to do, you want to hear from Tom, not from me, so please join me in welcoming Tom Palmer. Thank you, John, <clears throat> Tim, and all of you. It's been a real uh, pleasure to be here in Australia. I was telling some people last night that uh, it's been a kind of a dream. I meet Australians all around the world, and I had never met one I disliked. I can't say that of all nationalities. Uh, but I've never met an Australian that I found irritating or offensive or snooty or anything like that. And my thesis was possibly the government doesn't give them passports. I mean, it's a contestable hypothesis, and I now found that is not the explanation that Australia is just fundamentally peopled by people who are honest and decent and uh, not stuck up. And so it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to be here. A little bit about um, what I do with Atlas. Uh, we do have a global movement for liberty. Uh, we have universal values that are instantiated in different ways, in different cultures and regions and languages. But there are libertarians every place on the planet, increasingly active and willing to articulate our common values. So what Atlas does and what I do <coughs> is to meet people, find the right people, help them to get things started, some of my job is a little boring. I do a lot of meeting to create business plans and fundraising and strategic planning and budgeting and all those things because our friends in many countries are poets and dreamers and thinkers and academics and writers. But you also have to be a business person to make things work and make sure you don't run out of money in August. You budget for a whole year. You have a revenue stream to support activities. Then you've done everything correctly with the legal authorities, that you're registered properly, you're not going to get into problems on tax or, or other issues. So that's what the Atlas Network does. It's something I've been involved in, in long, for a long time. Starting in the 1980s, <coughs> I had um, uh, begun to work with people in communist countries and going there and finding the right people and then delivering to them things that would be useful to them. Books, uh, photocopiers, fax machines, which are very, very important and significant, and then also smuggling cash and other uh, resources. 
so that when communism did collapse, I don't take any credit, and our colleagues really take no credit for its collapse, that was reality at work. It was reality that collapsed uh, socialism. But what mattered was what was going to replace it. Let me make a little digression about this. Uh, there is a conceit that there was a great debate around the world between communism, free market liberalism, and communism lost. That is not true. That debate did not take place. One side ran out of resources and collapsed. It was reality, not our arguments, that brought it down. Which is to say, our arguments were correct, but they were not what made the difference. However, our ideas are important to what will replace monstrous regimes like that. It doesn't follow that because a tyranny falls, you get freedom. You might get another tyranny, you might get a civil war, you might get all kinds of horrible things. So that's where our ideas do play a very important role, educating people into the principles of how markets work, why the rule of law is so significant, what it means to have a culture in which people can disagree agreeably and not decide, well, I have to kill you now uh, because you're wrong on some theological <coughs> or philosophical or other point. And that's essentially the kind of work that we do with a growing network of think tanks and organizations like Australian uh, the Taxpayers Alliance and many others around the world. One of the groups that I work with is Students for Liberty, and it's a really, to me, exciting organization, what they're accomplishing. And I found it's a very good model. In some parts of the world, it's more difficult to establish a think tank because of the lack of capacity. And I'm thinking in particular in Africa, we have tried the think tank model. It's very, very difficult there. One of the problems is people who are capable, who have business sense, typically either leave the country, they go to the UK, they go to the United States or Canada or France or wherever, or they're co-opted into the corrupt, cronyist states there. And so that's a model that just hasn't worked very well for us. But what we found is the new generation of young people are tied in digitally to the world. They have smartphones, they have Facebook on their smartphones because of the cell phone revolution around the planet, and Students for Liberty is popping up all over Africa like mushrooms after the rain. That's a very exciting project, a thing I've been very active involved, actively involved in promoting it. <coughs> One of the things that, as an advisor to Students for Liberty, besides being a financial sponsor, I give them a fair amount of my money uh, every month to support this organization because I think it's important for the future. But I also explain to them you need to have a product with your name on it. You can't just be a virtual organization with a website. And so I produce every year for them a book. This is one we did on the morality of capitalism. You can download these books if you're interested in them. And my goal was short essays, not a big tome you have to read the whole thing and feel bad that you didn't get to the end, so not human action, uh, but a bunch of short essays that go all the way from something that could be understood by a bright high school student up to pieces that would enlighten a Nobel laureate. So that's a little bit hard to do, but I think that we've accomplished it. There's a range of pieces, some are footnoting and academic, some are more journalistic, there's no footnotes at all, so that people can dip into it and everybody could get something. And this has now come out in about 26 languages, and then the other that came out this last year after the welfare state, which now is an Australian edition uh, from the Center for Independent Studies, but you can also download the book if you're interested, uh, on the collapse of welfare states around the world. What a calamity this is, <coughs> what the harm that has been caused in Europe, North America, and other countries. And I've been here in Australia to talk about the direction Australia is moving. You are not <clears throat> at a crisis point like Greece or Spain or Italy or other countries, but you're headed toward that cliff. You're just about 20 years off. So you have an opportunity to fix that, which does not mean wait 19 years <laughs> and then say, let's work on it. This is the American approach, right? When they talk about spending cuts, 
Over 10 years, we're going to cut so much spending. Look at the numbers. First, there are no cuts. There are cuts in the rate of the rate of increase of spending. We call that the second derivative. Right? So it's, it's the rate of the rate of increase will go down. And then it turns out that even that is in years 8, 9, and 10. Which is to say, far enough off in the future, no politician has to worry about it. I talked last night about the new budget that the Obama administration has just released which is being presented in the media as a bare bones austerity budget. They are cutting everything to the bone. That's what you read the New York Times and the Washington Post. Well, I'll tell you, it is actually an austerity budget. It is pretty shocking what they're cutting. Over 10 years, they're going to cut spending from $3.8 trillion a year all the way down to $5.8 trillion a year. I mean, that's savage. Savage budget cuts reveal true heartlessness. Uh, in the so-called cuts that were discussed, to give you a sense of the state of debate in America, that almost no one has called them on this, the so-called budget cuts, when they say so many trillions of dollars in cuts, were the counted as a cut, the money not being spent by not occupying Iraq. <coughs> That's called a cut. The money that won't be spent after 2014 by not occupying Afghanistan, that's another cut. And then, $595 billion in interest payments we won't have to pay because we're not occupying those countries <laughs> and not borrowing the money to do that. And one of my colleagues at the Cato who pointed out, he said, you know, we could go further. Think of the budget cuts we are enacting by not occupying Syria. <laughs> This, we could go on with this process, not occupying Iran, not waging war on Mexico. The sky's the limit on what we can cut from the budget by not invading other countries. Now the question then is, in one sense, um, why is it that we do what we do? And here is what you typically find our critics say of us. You've heard it. We're selfish. We're greedy. We don't care about anybody else. That's why Tim has dedicated his life to the freedom of other people. Because he's a selfish bastard. <laughs> well, that's why he is spending all of his time earning substantially less than he could earn doing something else. He's so selfish, he set up an organization that pays him a pittance. He's so selfish that he gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning to save $130 on the airfare <coughs> to fly to another city to be able to make the case for other people's freedom. Shame on you, Tim. <laughs> Selfish person. In fact, they get it exactly reversed. <clears throat> True liberals, people who truly believe in freedom, care about the freedom of other people. That's why we don't want to coerce them. That's why we don't want to use force to tell them how to live their lives. Because the freedom of other people matters to us. It doesn't matter to those who want to use state power. They don't care about the freedom of others. Their own freedom, of course, may be a different matter. But you'll notice every socialist, when they articulate their views, they put themselves in the place of those who are the planners, never the planned. They're the ones who are going to be directing and exercising state power against somebody else. <clears throat> Sometimes it's a little surprise when it turns out they're the ones who lose their freedom. That wasn't supposed to turn out that way. The extreme cases and all the collectivist dictatorships, they had what they called the useful idiots. The ones who stood up for socialism, and they were pretty quickly the first ones marched off to the camps and arrested by the people who knew how to exercise real power over those use, useful idiots. So we're committed to the freedom of other people. There's a great uh, figure I like to quote here, one of the great abolitionists who got rid of slavery. Think about the people who dedicated their lives to eliminating that monstrous crime. William Wilberforce in Britain, 50 years of his life, every single day, under the worst conditions, he was dedicated 
to doing something that day to end that monstrous crime on behalf of the freedom of the most helpless people. Joaquim Nabucco, the great man who liberated the slaves of Brazil, <clears throat> the last country in the Western Hemisphere to eliminate uh, slavery was Brazil. His whole life, he was focused on that. And he said in his book on abolitionism, written after the fact, he said you should educate yourself, educate your children in the love for the freedom of other people. Only in that way will you come to see that it is not just a gratuitous gift from fate, but you will understand its worth, and you will have the courage to defend your own freedom as well. That is really the liberal credo. It's a humility, a humbleness, and a respect for the rights and freedoms of other persons. Of, of other persons. Now this also is a good thing to do. It generates all the good things we see in the world. The modern prosperity that we enjoy is a product of freedom, of people exercising their rights, knowing what their rights are, interacting voluntarily, creating wealth, and adding value to the world. If you have any doubts on that, you can find data that the Economic Freedom of the World Report from the Fraser Institute of Canada, you go to freetheworld.com, all one word, freetheworld.com, and there is such a striking, unmistakable connection between economic freedom and prosperity and every material indicator of well-being. We can see this across a wide range of different disciplines. Freedom makes the world a better place for everybody. Now the fact is that we have, in our cultures, internalized these norms to a very substantial degree. Almost everyone acts on a daily basis like libertarians. They don't hit other people when they want them to do something differently. They don't just come up and slap them. If they want something for another person, they don't just take it and say, would, is there something I could do that would induce you to part with that? Like, could I give you some money? Or could I do something that would voluntarily induce you to do that. There are criminals, robbers and thieves, and we recognize them as a tiny minority of the population and everyone else condemns them. When someone disagrees with you, you might be tempted to pop that person in the face, but you don't. The better person wins out and you respond to words with other words, or if the other person is really ugly, you walk away. <laughs> right? The other person is nasty and abusive. You just say, I'm going to be the better person and walk off. Most of our friends are the people we work with. They are liberals in that sense. They've internalized all those norms. And that, by the way, was not the standard for much of human history. Where if someone disagreed with me or insulted me, I had to kill him. How could you not? in cultures that were based on honor or revenge or feud. That was common. But in fact, most people today internalize libertarianism. But they don't make it theoretical. They don't understand the abstract formulation of it. And consequently, they don't apply it consistently to the other people amongst us. They walk amongst us. They're called politicians. That's the one class of people who don't behave that way. If you have something they want, they will take it from you. If you do something they don't like, they will have someone come and hit you. If you persist in it, they will hit you again, and then they'll drag you and put you in the little cage like a gerbil. Right? We call those prisms. And that's their mentality of how to get people to change behavior, whatever it might have to be. Someone is smoking pot in his or her own home, they don't say, well, that's a bad thing. They don't hand you a leaflet. They don't invite you to come to Pot Smokers Anonymous. Instead, they smash down your door and drag you out and put you in a cage. <coughs> so they have not internalized it. And the problem is our neighbors who have internalized libertarian values don't understand those other people are no different from them. They're certainly no better. <coughs> and quite often have moral standards that are dramatically lower than the average person on the street. It always shocks me when people 
you hear this in the United States, they say, all the communitarians say, government is a source of moral instruction. They set the standards. They really, Bill Clinton, you want your son to act like Bill Clinton, honestly? Or Richard Nixon? What a despicable, loathsome scumbag he was. And to think that's the moral exemplar for society? Illustrating how we should behave? Not very plausible. What you find is standards of conduct lower than that of the average person, substantially so. Partly because power tends to corrode moral responsibility. <coughs> So what we need to do is to help people to become full liberals, not just in their practice, internalizing the norms, but understanding in abstract terms. The rule of law applies to everyone. No one is empowered to just initiate violence and force against other people. All of us have to respect the rights of our fellows and to be subject to the same law with not a special rule for you and a different one for me. So our responsibility then is to go forth, explain these principles, show by example, and help our societies to become freer and more just and more peaceful. And in the process, more prosperous, more harmonious, more advanced, more educated, longer lived. We could go on with the list of all the benefits of liberty. That is the challenge that you face, and I was talking to a couple here earlier, about a few concrete issues of how to do that. I'd like you to share one or two thoughts, and then maybe have uh, hear your ideas. It's very easy for us to move into lecture mode when we interact with other people. We explain everything to you. And one thing I learned a long time ago is people don't like that. Right? When I move into lecture mode with my friends and I say, let me correct you about that, they somehow drift away. No one likes that experience. So we need to find other ways to explain our principles in ways that can use the media, that can make them fun, that can make them dramatic, and so on. Our friends in Brazil have been very active in this. I worked with them there to revitalize the liberal movement in Brazil. And here are a few things we did, just to get a, some thinking going. We commissioned a poll and found out the majority of Brazilians did not know they pay taxes. Rich people to pay taxes. I don't pay any taxes. This is about 65% thought that. This, of course, is false. They pay a lot of tax. And GST and value-added tax, all the taxes on everything. The huge amount of their incomes, even of modest people of modest means goes in tax, and they didn't know it because of the fiscal illusion, the way these are hidden from taxpayers. So they initiated a couple programs that have dramatically changed that, and here too. With O Globo, which is a big television network uh, in Brazil, uh, they did a series of public uh, education advertisements. They're very funny. I'm going to share them with Tim, who might post them. Uh, with you. You don't have to understand Portuguese to get the joke. It'll show some people enjoying a uh, beer, a group of friends, and up comes a gentleman right behind them, takes the beer, pours more than half of it into his cup, and joins them in a toast. He's a tax collector. There is a woman who's about to have an apple, and a lady, very severe looking tax collector lady, walks up, takes the apple, takes a big bite out of it, sets it back and it says, fruit, 23% tax. Another one, a woman is about to put on lipstick, the same lady snatches it away, cuts off half of it, gives it back to her. With lipstick, 61% tax. Gasoline, getting your car filled. And a gentleman, the tax collector, comes up, takes it out of the car, fills up his canister, puts it back and walks off. And it says, how much tax you're paying on petrol. This is how people to understand what they're paying in taxation. And the, the theme was, a very professionally done, taxes, it's important, it's your money, you should know what it goes to. This is changing the mentality. They did another thing that's a lot of fun. Calculate Tax Freedom Day, uh, 
in the country. I think it's April something here, but if you do it by spending, it's in May, because the government is doing deficit spending here as well. Big surprise. Uh, they calculated Tax Freedom Day, and on that day, they went to, they raised money in five of the major cities to buy so many liters of petrol, namely to pay the tax on it, which is like 60%. Then they issued vouchers the right to buy five liters or 10 liters of petrol at the untaxed price you could take to the petrol station. That meant a huge queue of cars waiting to buy 60% off petrol. That attracts the media because you can take pictures of it and you can film it. A long queue of cars, and then there they have someone making the point, being interviewed, and they absolutely blitz the media. Every year, there's a whole day of discussion of the tax burden and Tax Freedom Day and how to reduce the burden of the state in Brazil. And I should say also, there are lots of fun. These are really enjoyable experiences. People have a good time doing it. It doesn't have to be like a visit to the dentist. They're enjoyable opportunities to educate the public. And it has had a noticeable impact on the thinking in the country about the relationship of the citizen to the state. So I'll just conclude with thoughts that with groups like ATA and the organizations here, you can do that also. You can cut back the Australian state. You can reduce the amount of coercion. You're not going to reach a classical liberal nirvana any time in my lifetime, but you can reduce coercion, make it freer, and most importantly, have a lot of fun in the process. Thank you very much for your attention. And so we've got a bit of time for Q&A now. Can we get some more rounds All right, so food on the way and questions if you want it. Uh, Tom, we, we didn't go fully into everything Tom's done before, but if you have questions pretty much about anything to do with libertarianism, uh, he can probably help you out here. The recent book about the welfare state uh, has some great stuff that we didn't get enough chance to go into because of time constraints, but... Anything you want to ask? Uh, I've got here? one. Okay. Anyone who was in Sydney has heard me ask this twice already. The followers of Gramsci have had enormous... The followers of... Gramsci have had enormous success over the last 40 or 50 years. They've managed to march through the institutions. The British Cons uh, Conservative Party is an institution that's been marched through. The Australian Liberal Party is going the same way. The ABC, the universities, uh, PBS, Republicans, how many rhinos are there? I have no desire to take those institutions back. What I want to do is to try, uh, is to destroy their control over it and prevent anyone else from taking, taking such monolithic control. <coughs> have you got any suggestions of how, of how, this, can, of, uh, of how this can be done? Well, I'll make one meta point first. I don't think there's just one strategy for free society that is just the one. And I'm going to find out what it is and make all of you do it. Which is why I also suggest that doesn't work, generally. And it's partly a question of what your own interests and talents are. Some people are good at going into politics. Some people are good as educators. Some people in the business community could stand up for these principles or in labor unions and other organizations. So that there's many strategies in the sense that there are sets of talents and interests among persons. When it comes to the question of taking back institutions, I think that there are occasions, I'm not interested in taking control of state broadcasting and being as dictatorial as the other side. I'd like to get rid of it and have just commercial broadcasting. Uh, but if it were a matter of political parties, I'm not sure I, I would agree with that. I think sometimes it matters to take over or take back a political party. What matters to me is not which party it is, but that some party advanced liberty. And that could be a party of the left or a party of the right, and it will depend on the circumstances and the time and the occasion. I don't think our, our views should be tied to one party or politician. This is a death knell 
for the principles of liberalism. Uh, so I'll just mention the question of politics because it might be relevant to this group. It's quite often in our liberal movement worldwide, even more in the United States or Anglo-Saxon countries as a whole than some, people denigrate politicians for good reason and politics. It's, oh, it's dirty. I don't want to go into politics. It's a bad thing. And I think that's a mistake. I think that some people who are good at politics, people who can remember the names of other people really easily, people who make friends easily, people who can look you in the eye and make you think, this person likes me. Not all of us are good at that, but some people are. And if they share our values, it's good for them to go into politics. And the reason is, no wicked, unjust law ever repealed itself. Somebody went into Parliament, Congress, the Council, and said, this is wicked and this should be repealed. And we've seen that over and over. But it doesn't follow everyone is good at that. I don't say that's the only thing we should do. Some people can do other things as well. I'll give you one simple example of a friend of mine that uh, I got to meet through these events. Her name is Kathy Gornick. She is a businesswoman. She's been in business all her life with her husband, who is a brilliant sound engineer. They make the best speakers in the world, if you're interested in that sort of thing. And she was creating value and, and wealth. She came to a Cato Institute event. She got so fired up, she said, I'm sick of what we're dealing with year in and year out. And she took over the Consumer Electronics Association of the United States, which is the trade lobby for the electronics industry. They were protectionist and cronyist. And she said, I believe in the free market. I believe in free trade. I'm against subsidies and special favors for business. They fired all their lobbyists, took over the organization. She stood up, said, we believe in free enterprise. We do not want government favors. And she cleaned them out. She had a huge impact. And then, because she became a very stroppy, articulate spokesperson for our views, she was invited to a White House special summit. And she took the Secretary of the Treasury by the ear and basically yanked them. She said, let me explain to you what we need. Business is being strangled in this country. Wealth creation is being punished and so on. And it got in the New York Times and the Washington Post. That's a case. Of, she didn't go into politics per se. She did it in her business career and became a strong spokesperson with a, a powerful message that wasn't about special favors, but saying we don't want special favors. We want a competitive market. So I think sometimes taking over those, getting back those institutions may be a good thing for people who are good at that. What about things such as the university? So we are having more food. It's going to continue coming out until you're all full. It's starting to bring it out now as well. You've got a pumpkin pie here, by the way. You're going to have to get through that on your own. Um, but we have another question over here from, from Wayne Black, I believe. Hi, Tom. Fascinating the history when you're talking about the you know the uh, defeat of communism and, and how they ran out of resources. And that's what actually beat them. And what concerns me right now as I look around the Western democracies as you know the resources of those countries have been squandered by politicians who are, are using debt to buy votes and, and bankrupting those nations. Uh, are we next in line? To, to run out of resources. Um, I look around the world, it seems to be communist China is the, the, the powerhouse economy of the world. Um, so economically, they seem to be doing something right. We seem to be doing something wrong because we've allowed the, the socialists to, to, to win the government, to indebt us, to uh, just keep spending money, to in increase the nanny state, all of which seems to be completely against what we as freedom lovers really want in government. So, how, how do I mean, short, short of bankrupting ourselves, how do we fix this problem? Let me start with a slight disagreement on the characterization of China. Okay. It's a powerhouse in one sense that there's 1.3 billion people there. So, they will have the biggest economy in the world, but it doesn't follow they have the most prosperous. Per capita income in China is a fairly small fraction of what it is in Australia. 
Australia is without any question a far wealthier society than China, and it's per capita income that matters. So if you had 1.3 billion Australians, you would have the biggest economy in the world also. No, you wouldn't have any, not if you have a market economy. But so uh, China has been doing some things reasonably well by liberating some aspects of the market. It is undergoing an internal change that's difficult for outsiders to track. There is a revolution demanding the rule of law in that country. All of the official data coming out of China, by the way, are bogus. Don't believe it. It's rubbish. To try to understand what's really happening in China is a difficult job. There is economic growth, but it's not happening in the state-owned enterprises which are subtracting wealth from the economy. Li Wei Sen from Fudan University and others at the, our partner the Union Rural Institute have calculated if you take into account all of the subsidies that state-owned enterprises receive, they are actually value subtractors from the economy. The wealth is being produced in the private sector which is being financed overwhelmingly by retained earnings rather than bank credit, which goes to the state enterprises. So China is, is don't believe everything the Chinese government tells you about what is happening there. It's a much more complicated story. Australia is a wealth producing society. You are a wealthy society. But you have the problem of a growing welfare state creeping up on you and with each step, the next one is easier, and it becomes more difficult to undo. So let's take the case of the mature welfare states of Europe. Italy, Greece, Spain, they are bankrupt, utterly bankrupt. That is the future if you don't fix this problem. And they're going to collapse. And the question is, what's going to happen afterwards? And I fear, in some cases, it won't be pretty. You have the great advantage that you can head that off early. So I think you should take advantage <coughs> of that opportunity. I wish we could. The question is how. So do I. Um, just. <laughs> um, specifically in the context of the United States, though it probably applies to many other countries, when faced with the choice to back a candidate from a mainstream party, or someone from a libertarian party. The example I give is perhaps uh, the 2016 presidential election. Say if voters were faced between a Republican Rand Paul or someone from a libertarian party, whether that be Gary Johnson or someone else, who do you think libertarian voters should choose? There's one thing to remember about the voting system. In winner take all, first past the post, single member districts, which characterizes the American voting system. So-called third parties cannot get purchase into that system. You're always told you're wasting your vote because all you're going to do is take away votes from your more preferred candidate and elect the least preferred candidate. And the consequence of that is that third party candidates or more ideological parties cannot get political traction in terms of votes. Unlike Germany or Belgium or countries of proportional representation, where if you get 5% threshold, you have parliamentary representation. In America, if you get 5%, you don't get anything. You have to get the plurality of votes to get any representation in the legislatures or the Congress. So the logic of the voting produces two parties that compete for the median voter. This is where the action is. And that's why they become very difficult to distinguish one from another. Because they're competing for that median voter, where 50% are on one side and 50% are on the other. <clears throat> My opinion on that matter is, if you want to vote under those voting rules for a more rigorously intellectual or ideological or whatever term we want to say party, you should recognize it is an educational activity. So Gary Johnson, I love him. I gave him money last time. He was a successful governor of a small state that's overwhelmingly Democrat. He was elected twice as a Republican. He put issues on the table I like. Great guy. 
he and his followers convinced themselves they might swing the election. This is a fantasy. It's a fantasy all third party candidates have because when they go to a meeting like this, everyone says, I think you're great. Right? So you, they, they convince themselves. But they can't actually win the election. They can't be the swing vote. It's just virtually impossible. What they can do is put issues on the table for other people to discuss. And later, we hope other politicians will champion them if they see their interests. That's the most that they can do, and that's a positive thing. Um, if there were a choice between two candidates, one of whom was really going to begin to restrain the state, move us toward a more peaceful foreign policy, and the other one wouldn't, I would pick the one more likely to win, even if that one was not as rigorous as some other candidate. That's my view. Other people would cast their votes differently. This last election, I could not bring myself to vote for a totally empty suit like Mitt Romney. It's just it, it, simply impossible. Uh, and so I gave money to uh, Gary Johnson, but I was out of the country on election day, so I didn't vote. Lucky you. We'd have to pay a fine if we didn't vote. So early American headline now, Tom Palmer endorses Rand Paul. Um, Schneider and then Tom. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering, hearing about you talking about the path that we're on with welfare state and bankruptcy, do you worry at all about the image that gets around in some areas that this is capitalism failing and the way that capitalism is, is pinned on, uh, pinned with the global financial crisis and mismanagement of these things and that people will somehow misunderstand this and then use that as you know, a justification to take aim at capitalism? What, what is it that would be their justification? Uh, the GFC, what's going on in yeah, what, sorry, what's going on in Europe, and they're going to go. This is capitalism that's failed us, and it caused yeah. these states to bankrupt. Absolutely, it, well, it's not the truth. But it's we know a that. Argument. That is our responsibility to correct the record. That that that's what we have to do. So I spend a fair amount of time talking about the global financial crisis and those great free market capitalist institutions like the Federal Reserve Bank, the Federal Home Housing Administration, the Federal National Mortgage Association, the International Bank of Settlements based in Basel, Switzerland, the Federal National Mortgage Corporation. All of these institutions are laissez-faire capitalism. Right. Uh, they're all state institutions. They're, insti they're organs of the state. And they, at the very least, played a very important role in generating the housing bubble and then the subsequent collapse of the international financial system. No rational person can know that and say this is laissez-faire capitalism. And so we need to make that case and fight that battle. The problem that we have is that the socialists believe in magic. The first thing they do is they call everything bad in the world, they call capitalism. Poverty is caused by capitalism. Mosquitoes, obviously <laughs> capitalism. Uh, anything they don't like is capitalism. And we need to speak in a more clear voice and talk about, look, many of those problems are exacerbated or caused by statism, and the solution to poverty is free markets. Free markets cause wealth, and wealth is the solution to poverty. Poverty doesn't have any cause. It's what happens, it's what you get when you fail to produce wealth. What we need to do is to create a circumstance where people can generate value and wealth for everyone. So your point is a very simple one, but don't be discouraged. The other side will make their case. We need to make our case in response. I think we can do it. I think our case is intellectually more compelling more rigorous. We have evidence on our side. I had the experience of debating an, a living dinosaur, Frank Stilwell from the University of Sydney, which was a really enjoyable experience because I just thought it was pathetic what he was trying to argue for his case. It was absurd. And when you actually engage them, I think you find our arguments are better, but we have to make them. So I think it's only time for two more, so uh, Dom and then probably again. Uh -huh. so, in Australia, we don't have any sort of right to self-defense. And in terms of total freedoms overall, how important do you think that right is in regards to economic freedoms 
and rule of law? Well, of course, you do have, number one, you do have the right to self-defense. If someone were to come on up and attack you and you punch him out and run away, you have the right to do that. The question is, uh, firearms, which is obviously you're focusing oh, well, on. Even, even uh, you know, using a uh, pepper spray or using an umbrella to attack someone is deemed unreasonable force. They don't punch you too hard. They say, well, I'll deal with that. If I, anyone ever attacks me, I'll, I'll no doubt think about how hard I punch him uh, in response. Um, uh, He's also back up. Yeah, I wouldn't, re I wouldn't hang too much on that one issue. To be really frank and honest. One reason is sometimes it, it scares people because they misunderstand the idea of self-defense as being you're a primitive bad person. The fact of the matter is everybody in society with a tiny exception, tiny, tiny sliver of actual pacifists, which is probably about a quarter of a percent of the population, if there's violence they want people with guns to go there, right? We call them the police. There are very few people who say, I wish they would go there with petitions or, um, I don't know, uh, those uh, 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 nerf bats that sort of thing, uh, or anything like that. They want people with guns to go there when there's violence question is to ask whether we would have a better society if other people had the right to do that. I believe that's the case. I think I can make that argument. In a society that has been a substantially disarmed, but also a society, let's make another point, that is relatively peaceful, in which the vast majority of people here are just not violent people, it's a harder case to make. One thing to remember, if you look at the crime data in the United States, there is one thing that is driving violent crime. It is the war on drugs. Overwhelmingly, the violence people complain about is not neighbors having a fight. It's drug gangs fighting over territory and turf. If you want to eliminate that violence, there's only one answer and that is legalized narcotics. That is the answer to it, and it's one I'm willing to make publicly. I argue this all the time. The data is overwhelming. Getting people to admit that is difficult, but I'll mention one thing. Because the African-American community is the community that suffers so terribly from that violence, it is an argument that appeals to black Americans very strongly. Because living in their communities, they do know how they are victimized by the war on drugs and all of the violence that comes with them. That, that's the territory in which I'm willing to, to fight those issues. Right, so drugs and guns. Uh, Andrew, for the last one. Yep. Just one relatively simple question. In your speech, I heard you describe classical liberalism as involving a kind of humility. And I hate to be the semantics police here, but... In a culture where the primary myths which are used to encourage the idea of humility, we have the myth of Prometheus, we have the fall of the, fall of the Tower of Babylon and that kind of thing. Are you really using the traditional understanding of humility or are you softening it up for rhetorical purposes so you can claim humility when in reality classical liberalism is opposed to very classical humility, at, le at least as understood by the Athenian philosophers. And yes. most, Christian, most Christian theologians Give as well. Give me a definition of humility. Okay. Uh, well, well, again, back in the Hellenic traditions, again, the myth of Prometheus, the idea of hubris nemesis, the idea if you dead, consider yourself, you know, at a certain level, you were but instantly became the enemy of the gods and so they sent a divine assassin to kill you. Um, but you know, no, basically no. know your place, be on your knees. Notice what is the presumption there. That there are other creatures called gods before whom we should be humble. But liberalism begins with an assumption that all of us are born to equal rights and freedom. And if that is the case, humility doesn't mean that I humble myself before you. 
means I do not place myself above you. That is the sense in which modern sense of humility, which is expressed in a commonsensical view. I don't know how to live your life. I have enough trouble living my own. The idea that I would have enough information about what's good for you to dictate the details of your life is beyond my capacity. And in that sense, I think liberalism is a philosophy of humility. Okay. I said that was the last question, but I lied, because Gabe has an interesting question over here that I've been waiting to ask myself. Uh, yeah, my question just goes to what the end game is. We get rid of the, the welfare state. In my opinion, the whole state's a welfare state. So do you see a role for government in our lives at all? If so, what? Just a quick question. <laughs> now, there, there is a question. We had a discussion of what is definitions. What is government? Many years ago, when I became enthusiastic about these ideas, and believe that we could have a society without any coercion at all, I said, well, we should be against government. And I read a thinker much, 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 much older than I was. He died 11 years before I was born, who distinguished between the state and government. And initially I thought, oh, what a cop-out. He said he's for government, limited government, but he was against the state. I thought, oh, please, what, what a dodge. But as I learned more, I think he had it basically right. There are institutions of governance that are necessary for living lives together as free and equal human beings. We need rules. We need rules of order to help us know what we may and may not do. So we need government. The question is, do we need aggressive institutions that exercise violence against unconsenting persons. I, don't th I think the answer is we could do without that. Could you have a social order functioning at a high degree of prosperity and well-being and order and personal freedom without a state? I think the answer is yes, you could. But it does not follow that if you eliminate the state, you get freedom. There are lots of places with no states that are nasty, nasty places. You do not want to go there. Much better to live in Australia than southern Somalia. Even though you have a state here, uh, it's relatively limited, and it also exercises functions of what we could call a government, allowing people to live together cooperatively with the rule of law. So on my view, I would like to see a society in which there's no coercion at all. And I think it's possible. But it is one that one has to achieve by building the institutions that make possible voluntary cooperation. Property, legal institutions, which may be connected to the state or may not be. A lot of law, in reality, is not connected to the state. It's customary. and actual legal experience today, much of it is enforced and defined by institutions other than the state. So it's possible. And that's my ideal. Every step we get a little closer to that idea is a good thing. But I'll leave with one thought. Why I would not call myself, as some people do, anti-state. That I'm just an anti-state person. The state is not the only criminal institution around. There's freelance criminals, and robbers, and warlords, and, and wannabe states, and so on. My view is I'm pro-liberty. And to be pro-liberty means you understand the institutions that make liberty possible. You don't, you're not just negative. It's not just that there's something that is keeping us from being free. We need institutions that help us to be free, namely the law. Bastiat and others identified it. And that understanding, a stateless society is, in my opinion, possible, and with the correct institutions, it's desirable. It's not inevitable, and a stateless society without those institutions is Terrible. I hope that that's clear enough about where I'd like to go. Excellent. Thank well, you. I like that answer. Um, well, I hope you won't clap him off the stage because I am going to throw here to Tim Andrews for the final question. Uh, Tim Andrews from the Australian Taxpayers Alliance was the guy that uh, conned, tricked, convinced uh, Tom to come to, come to our dinky little country. 
Uh, and I think he's done a fabulous job putting this all together. And if you happen to be an obscenely wealthy person, start donating to the Australian Taxpayers Alliance so that the man can pay himself a bubble pittance. Uh, but I'll, I'll throw to uh, Tim to ask the final question, and then you can do the last round of applause. So, oh, um, <laughs> what, um, in your, and you, you've been asked this several times in the last week while you've been here, but in your travels and in the people you've met, you've had so many inspiring stories and so many inspiring people. And what I'd like you to share with the people here is that when we're catching the jet stuff flight at four o'clock in the morning, feeling incredibly hungover and wondering, why the hell am I doing this? What sort of experiences can you share to, from your time in meeting other people to say, you know, this is the right thing to do? Well, I think everyone here, just for a moment, and I want to sound like an old person, but I have to. For just a moment, do reflect on how fortunate you are to live in Australia and not North Korea, right? Not uh, ruled by warlords or horrifying dictators. So we understand that in relatively free societies, there needs to be more work to sustain our principles because they're always capable of being eroded. This is something we should remember. We should also be happy that we enjoy freedoms that other people cannot take for granted. It doesn't occur to us to think, wow, my village wasn't shelled this morning. The Janjaweed militia did not come through and behead the men and rape all the girls. We were fortunate today that they didn't come in and do that in our village. So we should remember that the institutions of liberty we enjoy, they are an achievement. They can be eroded. We should be grateful that we have them because of previous generations. <laughs>